Chapter 7. The Sinister Apartment If anyone said to Stjopa Likhaidev the next morning, Stjopa, if you don't get up at once, you will be shot, he would have answered in a feigned, languid voice, Shoot me. Do anything you like to me. I won't get up. Get up? He could not even open his eyes. He felt that if he did, there would be a flash of lightning, and his head would instantly explode to bits. A heavy bell boomed in his head. Brown spots with fiery green rims were swimming between his eyeballs and his closed lids. And on top of all this, he felt acute nausea. This nausea is seemingly connected with the sounds of a persistent phonograph. Stjopa tried to remember, but the only thing he could recall was standing with a napkin in his hand in some unknown place, it must have been the night before, trying to kiss some unknown lady and promising that he would visit her the next day exactly at noon. The lady demurred, saying, No, no, I won't be home. But Stjopa obstinately insisted, I will come, see if I don't. Who the lady was, Stjopa could not imagine. Nor did he have any idea of what time it was now, or what day, or what month. Worst of all, he could not understand where he was. Attempting to determine at least the latter fact, he made an effort and unglued the eyelid of his left eye. Something glinted dimly in the dusk. Stjopa finally recognized the wall mirror and realized that he was lying flat on his back in his own bed, that is, in the bed of the ex-jeweler's wife, in the bedroom. At this point, he felt such a stab in his head that he closed his eyes and moaned. Let us explain. Stjopa Likhadev, director of the Variety Theater, woke in the morning in the very apartment he shared with the late Berlioz in a large six-story building on Sadovaya. It must be said that this apartment, number 50, had long enjoyed, if not a bad, at least a dubious reputation. Only two years ago, it still belonged to the widow of the jeweler de Fougere, Anna Francovna de Fougere, a respectable and very efficient lady of 50, let three of her five rooms be go to rumors. Um, one whose name, I believe, was Bilamut, and another whose name is lost. Two years ago, however, a series of inexplicable events began to plague the apartment. People began to disappear from it without a trace. For a long time, all sorts of legends circulated in the house about the cursed apartment and its lost residents. Then, it was rented by the late Berlioz with his wife, and by this Stjopa also with his wife. Naturally, the moment they moved into the damned apartment, all sorts of infernal things began to happen. Namely, both wives disappeared within a single month. But these did not disappear without a trace. Of Berlioz's wife, it was said that she was seen in Kharkov with a ballet master. As for Stjopa's wife, she was alleg allegedly discovered on um, Bozhodomka Street, where, gossip had it, the director of the Variety Theater had managed, with the aid of his innumerable acquaintances, to find her a room, but on one condition, she was never to show her face on Sadovaya. And so, Stjopa moaned. He wanted to call the housemaid, Grunia, and ask her for aspirin, but... Even in his present state, he realized that it was stupid, for Grunia would, of course, have no aspirin. He tried to call Berlioz and groaned twice, Misha, Misha. But, as you can easily surmise, he got no answer. The apartment was utterly silent. Wriggling his toes, Stjopa guessed that he was in his socks. He passed his shaking hand along his thigh to determine whether he had his trousers on, but could determine nothing. At length, seeing that he was uh, solitary and abandoned, with no one to help him, he decided to get up, no matter what inhuman effort it might cost him. Stjopa tore his eyelids open and saw himself reflected in the wall mirror in the shape of a man with his hair standing up in all directions, with a bloated physiognomy overgrown with black stubble, with swollen eyes, in a soiled shirt with a collar and tie, in underpants and socks. This was his image in the glass, and next to the glass he saw an unknown man, dressed in black, with a black beret. Stjopa sat up in his bed, and his bloodshot eyes bulged as much as they could at the stranger. It was the stranger who broke the silence, saying in a low, heavy voice with a foreign accent, 
Good morning, my most charming Stepan Bogdanovich. There was a pause after which, making a violent effort, Stepa asked, What do you wish? and was astonished, not recognizing his own voice. The what was said in a treble, the do you in a basso, and wish did not come out at all. The stranger smiled amiably, took out a large gold pocket watch with a diamond triangle on the lid. It rang eleven times, and he said, Eleven. I have waited for your awakening exactly an hour, for you asked me to come at ten, and here I am. Stepa felt for his trousers on the chair next to the bed and whispered, Sorry. He put on his trousers and asked hoarsely, Will you please tell me your name? He found it difficult to speak. At every word, somebody stuck a needle into his brain, causing him infernal pain. Oh, so you've forgotten my name too? The stranger smiled. Forgive me. Stopper croaked, feeling that his hangover was generously presenting him with a new symptom. It seemed to him as though the floor by the bed had vanished somewhere, and that he was about to fly headfirst to the devil's own mother in hell. My dear Stepan Bogdanovich, the visitor spoke with an understanding smile, no aspirin will help you. Obey the wise old rule. Cure like with like. The only thing that will restore you is a glass or two of vodka and a hot, spicy snack. Stopa was a shrewd man. Sick though he was, he knew that once he was caught in this condition, he had best admit everything. Frankly speaking, he began barely able to turn his tongue. Last night, I went on a bit of a... Not another word, the visitor cried and slid away sideways with his chair. Stopa's eyes goggled as he saw on a small table a tray with sliced white bread, caviar in a dish, white marinated mushrooms on a plate, something in a saucepan, and finally some vodka in a good-sized decanter that had once belonged to the ex-jeweler's wife. It struck him particularly that the decanter was uh, misted with cold. However, this was easily explained. It rested on a bowl packed with ice. In short, the service was expert and immaculate. The stranger did not allow Stopa's astonishment to reach the painful stage and deftly poured him half a tumbler of vodka. And you? squeaked Stopa. With pleasure. Stopa brought his tumbler to his lips with a shaking hand and the stranger emptied his in a single gulp. Chewing a fork full of caviar, Stopa managed to squeeze out the words, And you? Have a bite? Thank you, I never do, answered the stranger and poured a second drink. They uncovered the saucepan and found that it contained sausages with tomato sauce. And soon the accursed green clouds before Stopa's eyes melted away. Words began to come more easily, and best of all, his memory began to clear. He recalled that he had been in Shodne the night before, at the summer home of the sketch writer Hustov, uh, where this Hustov has taken him in a taxi. He also remembered how they hired the taxi at the Metropole in company of a third man, an actor, no, no, not an actor, somebody with a phonograph and a suitcase. Y yes, yes, it was the summer home. He also remembered that the phonograph made the dogs howl. But the lady Stopa was trying to kiss remained unexplained. The devil knew who she was. It seemed she worked at the radio station, but maybe she didn't. Thus, the previous day was slowly coming into focus. But Stopa was far more interested in the present day, and particularly in the appearance of a stranger in his bedroom with vodka and an elegant snack at that. That was something he would not mind having explained. Well, I hope you remember my name now. But Stopa merely smiled with embarrassment and raised his hands. But r really, I have no idea. You drunk poured after vodka. My dear man, don't you know how this is not done? I want to ask you, please let this remain between us. Stopa begged obsequiously. But of course, of course. Uh, but naturally, I cannot vouch for Hustov. So you know Hustov too? I saw him at your office yesterday, but a single glance at him is enough to see that he's a scoundrel, a gossip, a toady, a parasite. How true! 
Stjopa thought, amazed at this brief, sharp and accurate description of Hustov. Yes, the previous day was coming together piece by piece. But the director of the Variety Theatre continued to feel anxious. There was a huge, black, gaping hole in the day. Say what you will, but Stjopa had not seen the stranger in the beret in his office at all. A professor of black magic, Voland, the visitor said importantly, seeing Stjopa's confusion. And he told them everything in order. Yesterday afternoon, he arrived in Moscow from abroad and immediately called at Stjopa's office to offer his services to the theater. Stjopa telephoned the Moscow Regional Theatrical Commission to get approval. Stjopa turned pale and blinked. And then he signed a contract with Professor Voland for seven performances. Stjopa opened his mouth and asked Voland to come this morning at 10 o'clock to discuss details. And here he was. On arrival, he met the housemaid Grunia, who explained that she had just come in herself, that she was a day maid, that Berlioz was out, and if the visitor wished to see Stepan Bogdanovich, he could go to his bedroom himself. Stepan Bogdanovich, she said, was a heavy sleeper, and she would not try to wake him. When he saw the condition Stepan Bogdanovich was in, the artist sent Grunia to the nearest gourmet shop for vodka and food and to the drugstore for ice, and, uh, allow me to pay you. The crushed Stjopa whimpered and began to look for his wallet. Oh, what nonsense, exclaimed the artist, and would not hear of it again. And so the vodka and the snack were explained. And yet, Stjopa was still pathetic to behold. He remembered absolutely nothing about a contract, and he was ready to stake his life that he had not seen this Voland yesterday. Yes, Hustov had been there, but not Voland. May I see the contract? Stjopa asked quietly. Uh, certainly, certainly. Stjopa glanced at the paper and froze. Everything was in its proper place. First, Stjopa's own dashing signature, a slanting note on the margin in the hand of a theater financial manager, Rimsky, authorizing the payment of 10,000 rubles to the artist Voland as an advance against the 35,000 due him for seven performances. And... Even Volan's signature, attesting to his receipt of the tenth thousand. What is this? Stjopa thought miserably, and his head began to spin. Was he beginning to suffer ominous lapses of memory? But of course, after the contract was presented, further expression of astonishment would have been improper. Stjopa excused himself for a moment and ran to the hallway as he was, in socks, intending to telephone. On the way, he cried in the direction of the kitchen, Grunia! But no one answered. He glanced at the door of Berlioz's study, which was next to the foyer, and stood, as they say, petrified. On the door handle, there was a huge circle of sealing wax on a cord. What now? Somebody barked in Stopa's head. That's all we need. And Stopa's thoughts raced off along double tracks. But as always, in times of disaster, in tangential directions, and generally God knows where. It would be difficult to convey the confusion in his head. First, that infernal business with the black beret, chilled vodka, and the incredible contract. And now, if you please, the seal on the floor, on the door. You could tell anyone else that Berlioz has gotten into mischief, but not to Stjopa. By God, he wouldn't believe it. And yet, there was the seal. Well, and then some nasty little thoughts began to stir in Stjopa's brain. As if in spite, he had just recently given Mikhail Alexandrovich an article for publication in his magazine. Between us, the article was idiotic. It was worthless, and the money was nothing to speak of. Immediately after the article, he recalled that some dubious conversation that had occurred, if he remembered rightly, on April 24th, right here in the dining room, as Stopa was having dinner with Mikhail Alexandrovich. That is, of course, the conversation could not be described as dubious in a full sense of the word. Stopa would never have entered into such a conversation, but it was on a useless topic. He could just as well, my dear citizens, have stayed away from such conversations. Before the appearance of the seal, this could unquestionably have been regarded as a mere trifle, but after the seal... Ah, Berlioz, Berlioz, Stopa's mind rebelled. Who would imagine it? But he had no time for wailing and Stopa dialed the number of the financial manager of the Variety Theatre, Rimsky. Stopa's position was delicate. To begin with, the foreigner 
might take offense at Stopa's attempt to verify his words after he had shown the contract. Besides, it was difficult to speak to the financial manager. After all, one could not say, Tell me, did I sign a contract yesterday with the professor of black magic for 35,000 rubles? No, such a question would not do. Yes, he heard Rimsky's sharp, unpleasant voice in the receiver. Uh, good morning, Grigory Danilovich. Uh, Stepa spoke quietly. This is Likhadeev. I'm calling you... Mm, mm, well, uh, I have this, mm, this... This artist, Voland, here. And uh, I wanted to ask you, how about this evening? Ah, the magician, Rimsky answered. The posters will be ready momentarily. Uh-huh, Stepa said in a faint voice. Well, see you. Are you coming in soon? asked Rimsky. In 30 minutes, answered Stopa, and he up, clutched his burning head with his hands. It was a nasty business. What was happening to his memory, dear citizens, huh? However, it was awkward to remain in the foyer any longer, and Stopa formed an immediate plan. He would do all he could to conceal his incredible forgetfulness and slyly maneuver the foreigner into telling him what exactly he intended to show that night at the theater entrusted to Stopa's management. Stopa returned from the telephone, and in the hallway mirror, which the lazy Grunia has not dusted for a long time, he clearly saw a most peculiar individual, lanky as a pole and in a pince-nez. Ah, if only Ivan Nikolaevich had been there, he would have recognized this character at once. The individual was reflected for a moment and vanished. Stopa anxiously peered further into the hallway and was jolted a second time for a huge black tom cat passed through the mirror and also disappeared. Stopa's heart dropped as he swayed. What is this, he thought. Am I going mad? Where do these reflections come from? He looked into the hallway and cried in alarm. Grunia, what is this cat slinking around here? Where does he come from? And who else is here? Don't worry, Stepan Bogdanovich, a voice replied from the bedroom, but it was not Grunia's voice. The tome is mine. Don't be nervous. And Grunia is not here. I sent her to Voronish. She complained that you had cheated her out of her vacation. The words were so absurd and unexpected that Stopa decided he had not heard right. In total confusion, he trotted back to the bedroom and froze on a threshold. His hair stirred on his head and small drops of sweat broke out on his forehead. His guest was no longer alone in the bedroom. The second chair was occupied by the character he had just glimpsed in the hallway. Now he was clearly visible. A tiny feather mustache, one lens glinting in the pince-nez, the other missing. But there were even worse things in the, pe in the bedroom. A third visitor sprawled insolently on the padded ottoman that had once belonged to the jeweler's lady, namely a black tomcat of terrifying proportions with a glass of vodka in one paw and a fork in the other, with which he had already managed to impale a pickled mushroom. The dim light in the bedroom began to fade out altogether in Stopa's eyes. So that's how people lose their minds, he thought, and caught at the door's post. I see that you're a little surprised, my dearest Stepan Bogdanovich, Volant inquired of Stopa, who stared at the room with chattering teeth. But there is nothing to wonder at. This is my retinue. The tomcat emptied his glass of vodka, and uh, Stopa's hand began to slide down the doorpost. And this retinue requires space, continued Voland. So that we have one too many in the apartment, and it seems to me that the one is you. Uh, they, they, the lanky, checkered character bleated like a goat, referring to Stopa in the plural. Generally, they've been behaving like a dreadful swine lately, drinking, having affairs with women on the strength of their position in the theater, not doing a stitch of work, and really incapable of doing any, since they don't know the first thing about the job, putting things over on their superiors. Using the government cat, car, for nothing. The tomcat tattled as he chewed his mushroom. 
And now came the fourth and final appearance in the apartment, while Stopik, who had already slipped down to the floor, was clawing at the doorpost. A new visitor stepped straight out of the mirror, small but extraordinary wide in his shoulders, in a derby and with a fang projecting from his mouth, which made his incredibly odious physiognomy still more revolting, and on top of everything, with fiery red hair. I, the new arrival, entered the conversation, generally failed to see how he ever got to be a director. The redhead's voice became more and more nasal. If he is a director, I am an archbishop. You don't look like an archbishop, Azazello, remarked the Tom, piling sausages on his plate. That's what I'm saying, the redhead drawled nasally, and turning to Voland, he added deferentially, Permit me, monsieur, to throw him the hell out of Moscow? Scat! The tomcat roared suddenly, his fur bristling, and then the bedroom began to spin around Stopa. His head struck the doorpost, and he thought, and the thought flashed through his mind as he lost consciousness. I am dying. But he did not die. Opening his eyes a little, he found himself sitting on something made of stone. He heard a rushing noise. When he opened his eyes properly, he saw that the noise came from the sea, and that the waves rocked at his very feet. In short, he was sitting at the very end of a jetty, with a dazzling blue sky over him, and a white city on a mountainside behind him. Not knowing how people behave in such cases, Stopa got up on his trembling feet and walked along the jetty down toward the shore. A man stood on the jetty smoking and spitting in the sea. He looked at Stopa wildly and stopped spitting. Then Stopa pulled a crazy stunt. He dropped on his knees before the unknown smoker and asked, I implore you, tell me, what city is this? Well, said the heartless smoker, I am not drunk, Stopa said hoarsely. Something happened to me. I am sick. Where am I? What city is this? Oh, well, Yalta. With a quiet sigh, Stopa toppled sideways his head striking the sun-warmed rock of the jetty. Consciousness abandoned him. End of chapter 7